Hi. <laughs> Hello. So, we'll, so everyone is present now. Yeah. Okay. We have all the panel members. So let's start the day for the panel discussion. I'll, I'll, I'll let do all the panel members do the talking, but I'll just introduce uh, the panel discussion theme. So theme is what will be the future of AI for manufacturing. And we have all the panel members here. So I'll want Helenio to take the stage and Chitray to follow up and then uh, carry on with the conversation. It's around an hour's time. Yeah. Helenio, over to you now. Thanks, Nitin, and thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Uh, my name is Helenio Gilbert, and I'm the Senior Director for Edge Solutions at Schneider Electric. And uh, today, uh, we're here to talk about a very, very good topic, a very amazing topic, which is the future of artificial intelligence in manufacturing. And uh, we'll be talking about the big trends that you should be keeping an eye on uh, that could directly impact your business. Our goal today is that uh, uh, whatever your role in the industry, that you will come out with some ideas, uh, some new thoughts on some new things that you can uh, try or explore that will bring value to your business. For today's format, uh, we're going to try to follow this, the, the following. We'll take a few uh, moments for each of the panelists to introduce themselves. Then I will kick off uh, the session asking a question and we'll engage in conversation. And as we go, please feel free to submit questions because we much rather discuss the topics that you want to hear about. Uh, and uh, to make sure we do that, let us know what those questions are and we'll introduce them to the panelists. Sounds good. So with that, uh, let's start with introductions. And uh, uh, Brandy, if you would like to go first. Sure. My name is Brandy LaFontaine, and I'm currently the Vice President and Chief Data Officer of the Obari Group. Uh, we're a holding company that has a series of different organizations within our portfolio that spans everything from marketing agencies, so supporting large-scale enterprises, predominantly in the multi-franchise units, with helping them to, to maximize their media spend and really engaging with them as a creative partner so that they can drive additional value for their clients, um, both franchise level as well as direct B2C clients. On top of that, we also have a series of organizations that manufacture, develop products, predominantly in the outdoor space, which we then go right from manufacturing development all the way through to the brick and mortar and e-commerce sales platforms. So we're out there in the market selling those products and driving engagement. And as the chief data officer, my responsibility spans everything from data governance, data engineering, right through to maximizing the value from our data assets at each one of the organizations that we have an opportunity and really an honor uh, to support in their journey of development. Some of the things that we're the most excited about at the organization right now is developing attribution models, um, optimization of media, and really maximizing the value of the spend from our clients. Prior to working with the Ovari Group, I've had the opportunity to work across a myriad of industries. And I think that that's one of the things that's the most interesting is that AI is this common language. Data is a common concept across all of the industries that I've had the opportunity to work with. We all face the same problems, but the opportunities to maximize the value from your data are consistent. Um, WestJet, we did revenue management, really learning how to build those algorithms to maximize the value of every single seat. So selling the right, seat the right price to the right customer. And it's about finding those opportunities to generate incremental value. Um, after that, I had an opportunity to work with NMAX and an absolutely amazing group of citizen data scientists, actual data scientists, and helping them to maximize their customer value. How do you understand churn? How do you understand when somebody's gonna leave your organization before they even think to do so? So you can intervene and keep them with you. Uh, Finning International, absolutely amazing experience, had the opportunity to be their uh, global pricing director, um, as well as working across developing their domain analytics foundation and working with their data science team to really work within the, the Caterpillar's automation and IoT to drive value for our clients. As a service provider for Caterpillar, it's important for us to really understand the best way to keep those machines up and running all of the time so that our clients are always in the market and always moving. And then after that, working with Benevity, a software as a service company, and they're transforming the world through purpose. And really, again, at the end of the day, it's about understanding the customer first and how do you drive those solutions that provide value for the organization so that they can make the best use of their data assets. 
Thank you, Brandy. That's uh, uh, very impressive. Um, Jordan, would you like to go next? Great, thank you. Uh, thanks for having me. I am uh, Jordan Lapp. I'm the head of product at Tech Resources, which is Canada's largest diversified resource company, um, mainly mining. Uh, to give you an idea of our size, four of our mines in the Elk Valley in British Columbia were about uh, are about one uh, percent of Canada's GDP. Um, so we are by far Canada's uh, Western Canada's largest shipper. Uh, we send about four to five full fully loaded trains um, to our ports in Vancouver every day. Uh, we deal mainly in copper, zinc, and uh, clean coal, metallurgical coal. So. Um, yeah, the project that we're involved in right now is a digital transformation. Um, my, mining right now is undergoing the same kind of transformation that forestry went through in the 90s. Um, it used to be in the 90s, you'd have a bunch of lumberjacks that would go out and harvest trees, uh, float them down rivers, etc. cetera. Um, nowadays, there are no forestry companies. There are robotics companies that sell wood. Um, in 10 to 15 years there won't be any mining companies, there'll be software companies that sell minerals, right, in the <laughs> same way. Um, some of the work that we're doing, we've generated about $840 million over the past uh, 18 months in margin up uplift. So um, most of you might know that the difference between margin uplift and cost cutting is that margin uplift, we're reducing waste, not, not cutting costs, right? So there's a crucial difference. And in mining, Waste usually goes into the environment, right? Like, unfortunately, it's a dirty industry. Um, you know, to give you an example, we have uh, those nine foot tall haul truck tires, right? The, the haul trucks are 420 tons. They're quite large. Um, so those tires, they're not recyclable. We have permission from the government to bury them in certain locations. Um, so, so one of the projects that we're undertaking is to increase the lifespan of those tires, which means fewer tires that are buried. And you save in the greenhouse gases in producing those tires as well. And the savings is not insubstantial. Like we can increase the lifespan of those tires by three to four hundred percent, and we might be able to achieve two to three thousand percent using data analytics. Um, and one of the ways that we do that is um, those tires, as you can imagine, four hundred and twenty tons on them. They're under a, a huge load, right? They're very high pressure. Often they're up in the mountains. Um, you know, like there's there's not a lot of uh, tree cover, uh, not a lot of shade, so they can heat up quite rapidly. And it turns out they can explode if they get too hot. So we can monitor those tires live, predict when they're about to fail, and either shut down the truck remotely, slow it down remotely, or send it into uh, the shop to get uh, serviced. So um, so yeah, I mean, th that's that's just one of the very smallest projects that we're involved in right now. Uh, eventually, we're going to produce a digital twin of the mine uh, and have AI run huge aspects of it, or at least uh, right now we're working on suggestion engines, and those suggestion engines might be action engines very, very shortly. Excellent. Thank you very much, Jordan. Um, Jamie. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. So I wanted to bridge off of Jordan's comments. You know, I got my start in smart machines and smart manufacturing at National Instruments, and mining was a key component of our customer base. And what we found in mining as well as power generation is the first artificial intelligence application that got deployed, deployed was predictive maintenance. Predictive maintenance is a great place to start where you're acquiring data and using analytics to determine when things are going to fail and what their expected life will be. And then uh, smart vision systems using artificial intelligence to optimize manufacturing is where things go from there. So I have a, a fairly long career in smart manufacturing, uh, starting with National Instruments, where I led the industrial Internet of Things business there, and then moved on to driving their autonomous vehicle test business. And now I actually work in education technology where we're taking camera systems and adding AI to do auto tracking systems. So instructors can teach in the classroom and bring remote students into the classroom without disrupting the way they, they teach and without needing a director or someone to, to guide the camera and, and guide that, that content creation and uh, video system. I'm, I'm very excited to be here and learn uh, 
what our fellow panelists are thinking about and what's motivating them, what's challenging them, and to add uh, the comments uh, when appropriate. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much. And last but certainly not least, uh, Chitray. Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Chitray Mani. Um, I'm from uh, uh, Infovision. I'm a Chief Technology Innovation Officer, and I'm the CEO of Digital Labs. Uh, I'm currently heading a four product from Digital Labs. Uh, each one is focusing on multiple verticals. And some of the products are retail, some of the products are, um, uh, they're focusing on uh, telecom and some are on uh, manufacturing. Are all of you able to he hear me properly or are you facing some issue? We can hear you okay, but you're you know, turned off. Okay, I've disabled my video. Uh, so we are currently focusing on um, the products, some of the products as I mentioned is a more computer vision based uh, products, how to track the manufacturing environment, how the, for example, some of the cement manufacturing accounts we have been focusing on, how to track the end-to-end -end system, what is happening. The supply chain is the biggest problem in manufacturing industry, right? So there, how to bring uh, computer vision based solutions. And there we are building certain products of how to track the, the inventory information, where it's going, where they deposited, and where they are keeping it. The problem in the industry is whenever someone ordered it, the local field people don't know how many in the local. That's a lot, lot, there's a lot of gap in the inventory information from supply chain perspective. We want to automate it in a very fashion by using computer vision. Apart from that, we have been focusing on supportive product. For example, for computer vision, you need a lot of auto labeling, right? So tracking the products or person or any inventory item, you need to have a lot of training. We built the auto labeling or complete auto. For example, if you train a product, you need at least 5,000 images to auto label it, right? So instead of that, if you label it only 300 products, uh, images, rest of the images will be automatically trained. That should be great saving time for two days for training each and every product. So we are we developed a product on that side, how to automate the labeling of the computer vision also. So one of the area we are focusing is a multi-industry area focus. And we have built a cashless store model. It's more kind of retail and uh, manufacturing um, inventory, more kind of e-commerce business, uh, so retail business, and like Amazon Go model. And pretty much we are involving more AI ML demand forecast, predictive analytics side, how to bring more heat map information to the customer. So a lot of area we are focusing on this, adding to that, it's a combination of technologies, not one technology of just ML or computer vision. It's a combination of IoT, or we use a, a later technology, we use um, computer vision, digital twin, uh, how to visualize and AR VR as well, how to solve the problem in the manufacturing industry using AR VR, the next generation model. So we're combining the technology, solving the problem in the manufacturing industry. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I would like to start the discussion with a little bit of a level setting open question for everybody. Um, and uh, if, if you follow the news today, you may get maybe not the right idea of what AI actually is or, you know, how can it impact our world and uh, um, the industrial sector specifically today. So um, <laughs> by reading the news, you may think that we'll be saluting our computer overlord soon or, you know, or that uh, Skynet is coming and, and those things. And I want to set the level. So in, in your words, in 30 seconds or so, what is AI and what is it not? What does it represent to you and the, our industry uh, at this time? And uh, uh, Jordan, would you like to start with that? Thank you. One of my university profs uh, once told me that AI is the science of things that don't work, which is which is funny because once they start working, they assume another name, right? So right now we have machine intelligence, machine learning, um, you know, visual processing, etc. So um, typically we use uh, uh, machine learning, right? That's that's the revolution that's that's happening right now. Um, we stood up our organization two years ago from six people and now there's 500 folks working for us and it's really difficult to get resources, right? Everybody, every startup out there wants a data scientist, right? Even if they don't quite know what data scientists do, uh, data engineers, the same thing, right? So, um, I would say that artificial intelligence is a very broad area, um, the folks on this call are probably more interested in, in machine learning, right? Which is uh, function finding, you know? So 
basically it's uh, understanding a way to generalize solutions to very difficult problems. So a human expert might be able to provide you with three solutions. Uh, a machine learning exp uh, machine learning algorithm could provide you with a number of solutions that are very fuzzy in nature. Um, so hopefully that kind of answers the question. Right. And, and do you think that at this point, artificial intelligence uh, is replacing, and now we're getting a little bit into the ethical discussion on, on AI, is replacing workers or is enabling workers to be more efficient? Is it an enabler or is it a replacer? So in mining, we're very concerned with safety. So, um, you know, moving workers outside of uh, those trucks, right? Those haul trucks, they're dangerous, right? They can fall off a road. Uh, one of our pits in Kamloops is a kilometer deep. It's an inverted mountain, right? So, you know, unfortunately, remove, you know, like those, those trucks can be dangerous. You take workers out of them, you make them safer, right? Um, you get them out of the blast zone. We do a daily blast, right? Which is uh, 80 tons of M4. Uh, one, one ton of M4 was used to destroy the, 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 the Edward P. Murr building and the Oklahoma City bombing to give you an idea of how much explosives are used every single day on a mine site. So getting workers out of there is important. Um, and we, re as responsible employers, we retrain those workers, right? So um, I saw it in a haul truck with uh, a one of our drivers um, on a site where half of our haul, tr haul trucks were driven by robots, right? So they were driverless. Um, and I asked her, I, I said, geez, you know, I mean, you're working on the same site with the robots. Are you worried about your job? Uh, and she said, no, no. You know, if it wasn't driving a haul truck, she would, you know, be a, a shovel operator or uh, run a drill or any number of other positions within a mine site. Um, th the fact of the matter is, in Canada at any rate, and I'm sure this is the same in the United States, we have a worker shortage, right? We don't have a surplus of workers. So as... Um, artificial intelligence does, we, we are taking over certain jobs, right? There, there are not going to be all truck drivers in a year or two. Those workers will be retrained and put into other areas um, of the economy, right? And, you know, while we have this worker shortage. I think that's a really interesting point, Jordan. And just to, to build off of that, the, when I'm trying to explain the, the role of AI, analytics, machine learning within an organization or to the groups that I'm working with, I always really try to impress upon them that this is a compliment uh, to what you're doing. It might help you to do what you're doing with more value. Your job is going to change, but, but it's not about replacing you. There's an art and a science. Um, the art is the interpretation. The art is the application. Um, I think at some point, once we get into like the future, future state of AI, once we've really made that leap into the full artificial intelligence where the computer can learn, interpret, anticipate, then we might find ourselves in a bit of a different situation. But today with the maturity level of AI and machine learning, it really is an opportunity to automate those things, which quite frankly, don't make your job that enjoyable. Those water bird tasks that you do every day, the computer does them really well, possibly more reliable than a human, so that you're freed up to think more strategically, to do something a little bit more interesting and to really exercise your brain. It is more enabler, from my point of view, it is more definitely is enabler than a replacer. That's what I'd like to go here. So I, I want to point out, though, that, you know, like today we're building suggestion engines, right, that, that complement workers. In the future, we will be, yeah, absolutely, there will be some losses in, in even white-collar collar jobs, right, like um, with machine intelligence. It, it turns out that there are functions everywhere <laughs> out there and that humans often just operate on those functions. Um, but that doesn't mean that jobs are going to go away. If you look at, I started my career in banking, right? And I would have uh, clients come up to me and say, oh, I'm dealing with you because I don't want an, uh, an ATM, uh, an automated teller machine, to replace me, right? <laughs> Turns out there are more people in banking by a huge margin now than there were when automated tellers were introduced. Those people are just working more in the back office. Uh, they're working in cash transportation, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So they're doing different jobs, right? So in fact, th there are fewer tellers now, but there are more branches, right? So instead of having just one big centralized branch with 16 tellers, you might have four very small branches with five tellers, right? So more net tellers, even though the ATMs were introduced. Yeah, their jobs have evolved. It's exactly right. 
So on this topic, then the the next question, if we're seeing more AI being adopted and it's uh, uh, being implemented in in certain specific types of tasks, um, how aware should we be in potential bias in those AI models? And uh, what can we do about that? And uh, Brandy, I don't know if you have an opinion or would like to take this one. I, I think the bias is, is a really critical component to think about. Um, maybe not in the automation of, of a, the mining trucks, but even then, the, the bias of the, the person building the algorithms, if they have a blind spot when they're putting that together, they're not going to factor in all of the pieces of information necessary to make it as safe as they could. So there is a lot of learning, there's a lot of domain expertise, and there's a lot of creativity required in order to build an algorithm that, that's redundant. And even just being open to the possibility and when we think about AI and the application of, let's say, hiring, um, I probably wouldn't get hired because, quite frankly, I'm not a person that generally fits the mold for a multitude of reasons. And if we can start to, to factor in that concept for minorities, for groups that wouldn't otherwise be represented and have that top of mind when we're developing our algorithms, hiring diverse groups is going to allow you to have a more open perspective and making sure that you really challenge those models. And Jamie, you had an amazing um, talk about this when we first sat down to, to brainstorm on this. So I'd love to, to hear from you because they had a really great example, I think, that really speaks to this. Thank, thanks, Brandy. Yeah, I, I think the bias is really in the data set that's used to train the model, All right? So you have to make sure that you have a complete data set and enough uh, uh, pieces of data to handle all the use cases. One uh, pretty well-known example from the autonomous vehicle space uh, came from a team that did a lot of great work with camera systems identifying pedestrians. And they come from a cold weather state. And so they took their algorithms to a southern state, Florida, and began to, to use them. And they couldn't identify people because those camera systems had never seen a woman in a skirt or a person wearing shorts before. So they didn't know what they were looking at. And that's just one example. It's a pretty extreme example about how bias in the data can really influence the entire system in ways that even the developer putting the system together may not predict. Uh, so I think we need a level of oversight for sure on these systems. We don't want to just let them run until they've been established uh, and, and proven. Uh, but, but bias is probably one of the biggest challenges that we're going to run into that's going to slow the rollout of these systems. I, I know we're talking about manufacturing here, but I think there's a lot of lessons to be learned in autonomous vehicles. People had goals for the autonomous vehicle space. The, uh, there's an article I wrote that was, uh, you know, 2020, the year of the autonomous vehicle, where are they? Uh, and it's, it's up on, on my LinkedIn. You guys can take a look at it. But the issue that the teams ran into is the world around us is an infinite space. It's an infinite data set. By definition, the analog world is infinite. And so covering all the use cases that a vehicle might see under all the conditions, all the weather conditions, all the uh, reliability of camera conditions, all the conditions with traffic and so on, all the scenarios that a car might be in, it's an infinite test set. So getting to the point where we're confident that the algorithms will perform safely in the real world is very challenging. And with these systems, just like with human workers, there's going to be an element of risk. So when we roll these things out, we'll be taking risk. And it'll be up to leaders like us, the people at this on the panel, the colleagues at the panel, and the people here attending this conference. And hats off for you to coming and learning about these things. It'll be up to us to, to manage that risk and help organizations make the decision, yeah, it's time. It's time to deploy that autonomous uh, hauling truck at the mining site, or it's time to implement AI in our applicant sorting algorithm. Because the last thing we want to do is treat people unfairly or cause damage to equipment or even lose a life. Jamie, so that, I, I agree about the, the, the biases in data. I want to point out that there's um, there could be biases in the wind condition. So machine intelligence is trained using a wind condition. And I'll give you an example of that. Um, with our autonomous mining trucks, right, um, which, you know, feeds very well into the vehicle um, talk that you just had, um, they initially, they figured out the optimal path and they drove on that path. 
Um, and what happened was you get huge ruts in the mines. They were destroying, they were destroying the roads, right? Because they would drive exactly on the right path, right? Whereas human operators have, you know, they, they skid and they take corners a little bit faster, et cetera. So human operators wore the roads evenly. The, the robots wore them in very specific places, right? So we actually, because, because the wind conditions had just drive in the best possible way. So we had to introduce jitter, right? So into the algorithms, we had to make it so that the trucks vary their path a little bit in order to save the roads. It's like an interesting, the law of unintended consequences, right? You get it just right and it's perfect. And then you learn something new about the process and you have to really agilely respond to that and develop the methodology of influencing your AI to, to offset. That's what the unsupervised learning is getting to picture more unsupervised learning, how to improve more in agile fashion. That's, that's what I think uh, the gentleman presented before. Learn more, keep improving it autonomously. That's a major game is going on now. Yeah. Yes, yes, uh, excellent discussion. So, on um, the presentations we've seen today, we've talked about other technologies that are impacting or are benefiting from the developments of AI, like the digital twin, for example. And you can add on top of that cloud computing, edge computing. So, um, Jamie, which technologies do you think? are going to be influenced the most by the developments we are living through in uh, artificial intelligence? Or which ones are the ones that are going to uh, influence that development itself the most? Yeah. That's a great question, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of answer it. Let's see how I do. <laughs> so I, I think when we think of uh, artificial intelligence, and I want to bridge to one of the questions that was submitted about how long will artificial intelligence be a thing? You know, is it going to be a thing for a while and then go away? A, a colleague of mine called artificial intelligence the new electricity. And if we look at uh, gross domestic products of nations, one of the most highly correlated factor in GDP is the availability of reliable electricity. And so we have a hypothesis that artificial intelligence will enable and fuel economic and wellness growth across every industry. And we're just getting started. We're just chipping at the surface. We don't even understand all the applications and probably never will where artificial intelligence can be applied. If we think about where we are today and some of the challenges that we still need to work through, it's this, it's this issue of architecture. It's where will we do the learning? Where will we do the training? How will systems be deployed? Whether it's distributed systems or centralized systems, what's the role of the cloud? You know, these are complex issues that have pros and cons. And there isn't a, a, a right answer for every application. There's going to be an optimized answer for today. But that answer may change over time. So, so today, you know, things like cybersecurity are going to be critical. Uh, cloud computing, network reliability are all going to be critical. And we were talking about the role of 5G earlier in the call. I think in the factory, 5G, it's not going to be that critical, right? Because it's more of a contained, uh, we'll call it technology ecosystem. But when you get out in the real world, 5G and, and additional wireless standards are going to be critical because we need reliable, deterministic wireless communication to coordinate systems. So I said a bunch of stuff that I believe in, but I'm not sure if I answered the question. So why don't we hand it off to, to someone else to see if they can... Uh, Try to try to put a bow on this one. Just adding to the point, it's a great point, uh, Jamie. Just adding to the point from my perspective, we have been focusing on a lot of uh, 5G areas. Okay, so when you mentioned that AI, and especially in the networking, because uh, uh, the networking side uh, intuition is very much high. The problem in the networking direction is nowadays we have been working on one of the project. How to bring network visibility in digital world with the help of AI? We are combining these three together. The AI is going to be an important area based on the data, how to bring. But networking, when you talk about wireless, all the network, yes, it's a very critical. 5G is going to boom a lot. Every telecom industry is 
investing multi billions on this 5G enablement in one or two years is going to be very high. We are very close to working with telecom industries. And on top of it, I'm seeing that the network data with the AML capability we are bringing presenting to the digital twin is booming a lot in the in the area. So uh, you can visualize the problem in very real time in the digital twin, especially the topic of digital twin. That's what we have been uh, doing it currently. So that's going to change the game a lot with the help of not only really digital twin, two different technology that A is helping a lot, AR, VR, and digital twin. The combination of these two blending with the AIML is the one promoting a lot in the industry now. It's a very valid point on the networking perspective. Yeah. And I think that to your point, it's it's really about the evolution, right? Like I don't think AI is going anywhere specifically. I think the AI we know today um, might become a little bit more obsolete as we move into more advanced technologies, as we, as the space evolves, um, and it, it is evolving much more rapidly now. So we're on that like. Um, exponential growth curve. AI has been around for years, but it's really the, to your point, Jamie, and, and truth, it's the, the technological background to support it. It's the cloud computing. It's all of these other components that are contributing and allowing the ecosystem to really be rife for that evolution, that transformation, that disruption, even of the AI space. Yeah. One, one thing I'll, I'll pile on this topic. Yeah. Pile on. <laughs> one, one quick comment. There's, there's two technology laws that are pretty well known. Moore's Law, right? People are familiar with Moore's Law, which is the, the doubling of, of, of processing performance over, over time. There's, a, there's another law called Nielsen's Law, which is the increasing rate of, of bandwidth of the network. And it is roughly a fifth as fast. Both of these, of course, are exponential growth. But a Moore's Law is, is a five times as large exponent. So it grows much, much more quickly than the network itself. So this whole idea that we're going to take all the data, put it in the cloud, crunch it, and push it back is, is foolish, right? What we need to do is take processing that's pretty cheap and put it out there at the edge. You know, if we, if we use something like this, you guys have probably seen one of these before. When we do AI with this thing, we don't know what's running on the phone and what's running in the cloud. Or if we're using our, I got one over here, the, the lady that starts with an A. That lady, when we ask that lady questions, we don't know what's going on in the device, the Echo device or what's happening in cloud. And quite frankly, as consumers, we don't care. And, and I think that the more, what we're going to see in the future is more and more decision processing will be happening at these edge devices. And even training will start happening at the edge devices. Yeah, and I think that's edge computing. And yes. for the reasons that you mentioned, Jamie, is what's going to uh, blow up the, the lead on AI adoption, specifically around industrial applications, where communications can and usually are challenging still, even though there's progress being made, is not ubiquitous everywhere, right? So, and, and, and that's a big, a big uh, aspect that needs to be better understood by, um, by, uh, customers and, and organizations. So now let's turn a little bit. We talked about AI, what it is, what it's not, its potential, its other technologies. Let's say um, a, a, an organization out there is ready and say, you know what? I want to learn more about HR, a, a, AI and how to implement it. What would be your advice to an organization on how to get started? And what are the do's and don'ts of adopting AI? And Brandy, would you like to take a stab at that? Sure. I think one of the, honestly, the biggest hurdles to, to starting out with AI is, is I think some of our other speakers talked about is, is they don't even necessarily know specifically what data science is or what a data scientist does. So hiring just specifically a data scientist isn't often sufficient to get the full value. You need to understand data engineering. You need to understand where your data is. You need to have the tech in place to be able to support that. So in making sure that you have the right pieces in place to really support the full, the full ecosystem so that you're not just developing POCs, um, which is another topic from earlier today, is those POCs, fascinating. Curiosities are amazing. But unless you're pulling it all the way through in a very practical way to implementation, it's going to fail. And when you think about it, I, I, there's a recent study done where 82% of organizations don't think they're getting the value from their AI investment. As an analytics professional, that's terrifying in one sense because there's a ton of money going into this space. But 
on the other side, there's 18% that are, and it's because they're putting all of the pieces in place to support it. They have organizational buy-in, they're combining domain experts with scientists, with the data engineering and the tech teams, and they're pulling these multi-factor groups together to really pull these initiatives through to implementation, and that's where they get the value. Yeah. How would you sell the project to, to a, an executive team, to a leadership team? Like, uh, how, how would you position it in a way that is understandable and consumable at that level and that they will say yes? So I'll, I'll, put, I'll put a proposal out, out there. That yeah. With all of these systems, you need data to train them. That's absolutely critical. And oftentimes mm -hmm. the data needs to be associated with an outcome or some kind of result because you need to train, hey, when you see this type of information, that tends to lead to this type of outcome. <clears throat> Right. So the first thing and the easiest thing to sell is start capturing the data in an organized way. And once you start capturing the data, then in parallel, you can start prioritizing where the biggest challenges that we have within the organization. You know, is it a yield issue? Is it a people utilization issue? Where where's our waste? And then focus on that problem. See if, see if you can hypothesize a way to use the data you're collecting to address that problem. If you can't, figure out what data you need to collect. And I want to go back to Jonathan's talk from earlier. You know, he said, you have cameras. I don't know if you guys remember that from the call. So to use the cameras you have, your factory has so many sensors out there implementing these machines. It would blow your mind if you did an audit of it. So the thing is, is, most of the time that information isn't being brought in to a centralized location where it can be used. It doesn't have to go to the cloud, but it should be brought into a centralized data center on premise. So you have the data in an organized way so you can start, start using that data. I think yeah. it's that concept of data first, right? Like how do you make sure that your organization believes in the value of data so that the people at the front line are entering it properly, they're storing it. You, it is, a, it is a, an entire organization wide problem. Data can't just be left to the tech teams to solve because then you spend all of your time just munging through raw data that is not clean. And it takes so much longer to get to value as a result. And sorry, Chitra, I totally cut you off. So I want to pass it to you. Yeah, that's fine. So uh, your role is very important, Brandy, because if the data chief data officer is not releasing the proper data to the company, you cannot build any of the stuff. Uh, just adding to the point of uh, how we have built it for the real-time customers, uh, most of the customers ask for how really you want to start as a POZ of data is true, definitely no question about it, but identify the right use cases so where you will see the ROI. So it's two different kind of stuff. Some of the people look for what is the forecast and what the sales is going on, and some of them look for, because in manufacturing, this is, there's a lot of failures there. What is the movement of the data, inventory move, as well as process side, many things you can find out. But uh, as a use case perspective, finding the right use case, and belongs to that creating a right data move is very, very important when you talk about uh, the first POZ level. People are, what a lot of people are trying, hey, let me take something in machine learning, let me build something, show some hello world model, hey, how it is working, or else they are thinking too much. Some other companies are thinking, oh, enabling uh, innovation to the company is a big thing. For example, how to bring a governance first, how to bring frameworks, all the stuff, regulation. No, you don't need to get into that level first. Start with simple level, as uh, Jimmy and Brandy mentioned. So use case identification, uh, simple data area where you want to go, which one is really pick up. Try to frame a small team, small kind of framework, small kind of uh, uh, testing team. Start with that, see the output. It will easily grow from there. So governance, regulation, privacy ethics, uh, there's a lot of data modeling. All this will come slowly next step. But identify use case is the first one. So... What I hear, data is the first step. Good data is the first step. Um, how does that play with what we heard uh, just a few years ago? The whole rage was big data. What does that mean uh, for AI, if anything? Wow. Uh, misunderstood concepts because everybody thinks they have big data and some people don't they have valuable data and it is big in importance but it may not be large in actual scale in terms of what big data is 
Yeah, see, uh, the transformation of big, I was in an era of both. Uh, I'm very core cool techie architect on both sides, handle it, handle a lot of big data project. The problem for the decade, decade before was how to store the data, organize it properly, try to create the reports out of it or processing it for transformation analytics side, right? That was the major problem. There is no proper tools or uh, solutions available. The last uh, one decade was going on, not last one decade, 2001 to 2010. It's pretty much focusing on big data solution. That's why the industry was booming. But when last uh, five years, if you see, they have enough solution, enough kind of products available to store the data, how to organize it properly, well and good, because cloud matured a lot, but they don't know what to do with the data now. Okay, enough of data. That's what now it is transforming into more AI. Hey, because the cloud enablements helping the infrastructure, because the infrastructure is available, a lot of people are easily deploying machine learning model, everything. That's what the boom is happening now. So people are trying to leverage how to use this data to bring more forecast, more prediction, how to optimize more. That's what the trend is moving. Big data is still going to continue forever. There is no question. But how to use the data for using maybe AI now, so tomorrow is going to be something else in, uh, in AI itself, multiple channels are there. So what are the other things going to use properly is the question. So we'll be using for multiple things in the future. So what, one uh, comment I'll put out there back on the prior question of getting started and this whole idea of resource limitations. So there's a lot of courses out there that are these executive education courses that are highly technical courses. The University of Texas offers one, the Macomb School. It's a great one. It's online, You could, but there's a bunch out there. These things take about 15 hours a week. They're pretty intensive. The UT one is six months, about 15 hours a week. And if you have people that are leaders within your organization at the top, the people that are director level people, our senior managers under them, go out and take these courses. So you have a real strong understanding of what artificial intelligence really is, how it's implemented. It's not that big of an investment to make to really start to understand how to reshape your organization. It's a heck of a lot cheaper than hiring a consulting firm to come in and build a plan for you that we'll just say may or may not work for your organization. So that's something to think about that's pretty pragmatic that, that you could maybe pitch to your boss. Um, and if you Google artificial intelligence, University of Texas, McCombs, that's one example. I'm sure there's others out there and, and maybe in the chat, people could put some other examples of things they're aware of. Yeah, and thinking, just building on that like easy steps to get started, there's a lot of technology or a lot of technological advancement around low code and no code um, development in AI machine learning. And I think that that is one of the most exciting things. I know one of my colleagues is actually um, in the audience today and he's developed an amazing application that allows you to, to build microservices that take all of the, the technological responsibility or the, the extreme amount of technological understanding um, and expertise out so that you can actually get your hands on the code. You can get those domain experts moving. I know Jonathan talked about it. Um, and I think it is one of the most exciting opportunities to democratize not only data, we talk about that a lot in the space of data and analytics, but it's also democratizing access to the analytical capability to the power um, so that you can start to develop those POCs much more cheaply um, and using technology that has the wrapper so that you don't have to develop your entire um, a data science um, architecture in order to support it. So I, I know that that's one of those ones that's really exciting. That's brain toy for Kwame. Uh, I think one question from my side quickly to all of you as well. So a lot of companies looking for how AI is going to help you or A lot of, it's like a lot of people have a question. Am I investing unnecessarily in the AI or it's uh, really worth it? I would like to see your views as well, all of you. Um, please take it. Anyone wants to take that one? Jamie? Uh, could you repeat it? It kind of broke, broke up a little bit for me. What was the question? So how ROI, how to, how, is, is that the A investment, how it is mapped with ROI? It is really what oh, okay. the ROI mapping, yeah. Yeah, you know, I would say, I would turn around and say, how is lean in your manufacturing system or Six Sigma? What's the ROI there? How do you measure ROI there? And I would say they go, well, you know, we, we, we have confidence in it. We believe in it. I, that's the way I would try to twist the conversation and say, this is really 
an augmentive way to do things like Six Sigma and Lean, where you're really going to create an augmented process to improve the overall performance of the manufacturing system. And, and let's not focus on the ROI because we're not going to boil the ocean here. We're not going to do everything at once. Let's try to solve a problem. And when we look back and we say, did we solve the problem and are we happy with the result? They'll go, yes. And then you can say, did it cost too much? And they went, they might go, yes. And then we can say, well, let's look at the next one and see if we can do it more efficiently. Right? Should we do that? And if they say, no, it didn't cost too much, then the dam bursts, man. And you're just mm -hmm. going after these problems one at a time. So I would make it more about the return and less about the investment. I think it's important to, to note that you can develop baseline metrics as well, right? Like all of the data that you have that you're going to be feeding into your AI and your machine learning algorithms, you can set a baseline and then you can track and report consistently back to your executive team so that they can consistently have that benefit reinforced. And once you have the momentum to your point, Jamie, the, the dam does burst. You get one or two of these projects through and people start to see the value and all of a sudden their minds just explode with the possibility. And you have this opportunity to drive it throughout the entire organization and eventually you're just so busy you can't keep up. But that's a good problem to have. <laughs> yeah, what I would add uh, to that is uh, when I talk to customers around the possibilities, the options and how to introduce these type of solutions, it's really not a problem of trying to find use cases. Use cases are plenty. The real question that needs to be answered is, why would you pick that one? What's the business value that's going to be delivered? It shouldn't be just a technology validation project. It should be a business value delivery project. And then apply the, the principle of, you know, start small, prove the value, and then scale fast uh, to the points that were uh, presented in the previous uh, discussions as well. The image of the hammer on the screw comes to mind for me from the last presentation, which I just was like, that is so perfect. You got to find the right tool to fix the right problem. So sometimes you can build something really lightweight that gets you the value and you don't need to over science it. Sometimes you do need the full scientific approach with an absolutely perfect algorithm because really you're dealing with lives. So it's really about choosing the right path for each of the problems. Right. Yeah, and I totally agree with that. These are great comments. The other thing is don't outsource it. I mean, you can outsource it a little, but your people know your processes better than any external company, no matter what they say. No offense to anybody on the call or the panel or any point. You know, <laughs> it's, it's got to be a partnership with the team because they also have to own it. You know yes. what? Once it's rolled out, they've got to buy in and not be looking for ways to discredit it after the fact. It's the the point is own center of excellence team in this area is important to have because it is not like other application. It is very different uh, in the area. Yes. Yeah, and, and I think that's one of the changes that I've seen. Uh, again, from coming from a vendor that are the most in fact impactful to the to the market is that it's not longer possible to just build something and sell it. I don't think that's effective anymore. It has to be a co-development, co-innovation together, a partnership truly with the customer, right? So we yeah. can bring in the expertise from and experience from technology and maybe other customers. But Jamie, to your point, uh, the customer knows the process best and there's no replacement to that. And uh, they have to be part of the solution or it will not work. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah, please go. No. There's a question, Helenio, in the uh, chat box. I'm not sure whether it has been seen or not. Nowadays, due to Industry 4.0, traditional manufacturing practices is going down. As panelists, what is your views? Will AI and stay longer sometime, or some other technology will take over it? Charu has asked the question. Yeah. Yeah. See, uh, I think. Uh, I can take it uh, starting with uh, what I'm seeing in the industry. It is not uh, tech. AI is uh, one of the technology. Think of AI is not. The, it's artificial intelligence has a multiple flavor underneath. Okay, if you call RPA, IPA. We used to call even machine learning, deep learning. There is a lot of variation underneath in AI. It is not going to take over by some other technology, but uh, it is going to blend with other upcoming technology. That is what is going to be. Because more it's prediction, uh, it's going to needed by artificial side. So definitely it's going to blend with other technology. In future, it may be more AR, we are, I'm seeing digital twin. These are the areas going to boom a lot. So um, it will blend with. That is, it's not going to replace it. 
how data is blending with AI now, how AI is going to blend with other technologies. It's going to be evolving. Evolve. It's evolving as a right word and it's going to blend with other technology too. And I think drawing on Jamie's earlier um, metaphor around electricity and how AI is the new electricity. Electricity has powered so many more developments and we can't even at this point in time really imagine the, the future state, but AI will be the catalyst. It will be a, a key component of those future technologies. So, so that's kind of how I'm thinking about it is it's a stepping stone um, to the future. And, and I think that's a great segue to our last question. Uh, which is now, I guess, bring out your little crystal ball and let's say, where do you see the? Uh, <laughs> you actually have one, huh? <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. Has uh, yeah. <laughs> um, where do you see the evolution of artificial intelligence in the short, medium, and long term? Where are we going? Jamie, would you like to start? Booting my crystal ball, so they take this one. The <laughs> Google wow. crystal, crystal ball. <laughs> it's a, it's running, it's running a, an iOS thing. It's trying to boot here. Well, it'll be up in a minute. So you want to dig it? I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll dive in and just yeah. make a comment. So, so if we think about artificial intelligence, we're just getting started. We're seeing a lot of success with artificial intelligence in the consumer space. Right. AI is pretty prevalent in and around our, our homes and with our smartphones. And we're going to consider continue to see those types of applications. Those applications have one thing in common. None of them are mission critical. If you ask your assistant what your meeting is for today and they say, I don't understand what you're asking me. It's like nothing really bad is going to occur other than your your partner that's maybe a little technology averse will laugh at you, right? That's probably the worst outcome. But when we get into things that are more mission critical, these systems have to be more robust and reliable. So the simpler AI systems that we can trust how robust and reliable they are, they will get deployed in mission critical applications. They'll become broader and we'll get into this area of big data and bringing in data from multiple industries to make decisions, you know, traffic patterns, weather, you know, the price of corn, you know, all these other things will be factored in and people will make other mission critical decisions when these systems become robust and reliable. So it's going to be an evolution. It's going to take time and we'll still be early, probably for the next 20 years. It, it is evolving. Same. Uh, yeah. From my perspective, uh, AI adaption is happening now. So people started adapting. So the adaption happens, then automatically the technology will evolve. So that I'm seeing a lot of industries, customer, uh, even it maybe you are using maybe five device with the AI intelligence with you, right? So watch, it may be phone, it may be some kind of uh, many devices we are using nowadays with the AI. People are adapting that. It's it keep increase it. It will keep evolve. But as uh, Jimmy mentioned, are we matured enough to say it's very accurate? No, we are not. We cannot 100% trust at this moment. But uh, we are seeing that because of the infrastructure support from big players, as well as a lot of people, companies are investing on the improving on the side. I see it's evolving. Definitely, from my view, next 10 years, a lot of technology companies are going to focus on enabling it for the people. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, I don't know what to call this. Uh, Tesla CEO, uh, Mr. Elon Musk mentioned that no automation. He hates automation. I don't know how long if you know that. The surprisingly, it's going to it's going to be threat to the human. Uh, that's contract. Uh, it's create a contract statement about where we are, what we are talking about now, uh, because he's the one who made the Tesla car, which is completely autonomous, using a lot of machine learning, artificial enablement. But it's a reverse topic. But uh, definitely, I see is is a one. I think it's interesting because you're going to see um, this this battle between trust um, and resistance um, emerging as we go through this. And, and you see it in the media. You see it. That you see all of these big splashy news stories about where it's failed. So it is really upon all of us as leaders to to help to really ground people in what it is capable of today. And that it's not perfect. We're working towards perfection. Um, I know one of our speakers um, earlier, like, don't let perfection be the enemy of, of practice. You gotta get moving, you gotta progress through the 
through the, the implementation. Um, so we all have to build that trust. And I think the next five to 10 years are going to be really instrumental in ensuring that we are able to establish a strong foundation of trust um, across all of the business leaders, as well as throughout the entire organization. Um, and with that trust, it, it's going to underpin the opportunities for the future. And if we can't build partnerships with our domain experts, with people that are actually on the ground doing the work, um, it, it isn't going to be, if we aren't going to be able to reach the, the pinnacle of what's possible. We're not going to be able to really reach into that. Um, so I think there's going to be some technological advancements, obviously. I think we're, we're moving into deep learning. We're starting to, to build the capability that will lay the foundation for um, our autonomous machines to even feel at some point in the next 20, 30 years. Um, I think that, there, that there's a lot of runway and we're moving really quickly, but trust is critical. So we got to be really meaningful. We got to really um, be conscientious of what we're putting into the market. And then I think the white box uh, Deepak talked about earlier today uh, is really important. So if people understand if there's transparency behind what's driving the algorithms, people are going to trust it that much more. So we have to make sure that there's opportunity for people to understand why the machine is making the decisions it's making so that we can intervene when it's going off course so that we can maintain the course. Yeah, from 20 years now, I'm expecting a lot of panelists is going to be robots. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Robo panelists. I answer the question for consistently. <laughs> <laughs> those, those panelists are calling me on my cell phone and asking me questions about my car warranty. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, That's and then you answer, and they're like, I don't understand. And you're like, I don't know how to ask. <laughs> <laughs> uh, excellent. Thank, thank you very much, everybody. I think uh, um, the discussion has been very good. I think uh, what we've said is uh, AI, first of all, is here to stay. AI is going to transform our industry, but we're at the, I wouldn't say at the beginning, but we're still in the initial phases of adoption and evolution and more is to come for sure. So I just wanted to quickly thank everybody. Brandy, thank you very much. Jamie uh, and uh, Jordan as well, who had to leave us uh, a little bit early, but thank you very much for the discussion. And uh, Nitin, thank you very much for organizing this panel. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, everyone. I think it was a lovely panel discussion with a lot of thought process from everyone. I, think. I enjoyed it. <laughs> it's a free flow discussion. And thanks to Chitrai Helenio for moderating and Brandy, Jamie and Jordan just left for uh, giving a lovely thought process to it. See you all uh, in the coming uh, months as well with us, associated with us. And have a, we'll have a long term partnership as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you <laughs> Bye. Bye. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye. So, guys, we'll, we are on time, and Jim is waiting for us. Jim, are you there? I am here. Can you hear me? Oh, great. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Jim. Thank you for patiently listening to everyone. Uh, and uh, you must have a lovely in enjoyment with all the panel members for one hour. So yeah, well, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. I have to say, after seeing the presentations I've seen already and listening to the panel discussion, I'm really glad that I didn't go first because I feel like that's <laughs> been an excellent buildup. You guys have talked about everything. You've talked about uh, the key benefits of AI, where it's used in manufacturing, the evolution. Everything's been talked about. And uh, I think that leads in perfectly for me just to absolutely jump into an example and show you some cool examples that we have been successful with uh, using AI in industry. Okay, so please. Uh, yeah, so perfect. Can you see that okay and hear me okay? Yes, absolutely. Awesome. Okay. Hey, uh, so just again, thanks for the introduction. My name is Jim Wilmot. I work at Siemens in Atlanta and I uh, manage a marketing team. We handle all the somatic products that also includes AI. Uh, so we all do a lot of promotion for PLCs and software, IO, AI. So today I want to give you a little presentation on optimizing manufacturing with artificial intelligence. And like I said before, I'm specifically going to focus on some examples. So uh, thankfully, you guys have covered the background for me, so that's perfect. And I'm going to focus in the areas of quality control and robotics in this presentation. And uh, specifically with quality control, uh, this is basically watching the process, monitoring the process ahead of time as it runs, and trying to do a predictive maintenance for what the outcome might be in a certain way. And uh, as was mentioned before in the uh, panel discussion, 
AI is kind of a complement here in what I'm going to show. You're going to see existing applications that are running that we're actually going to improve using AI. So that's kind of what you're going to see within this quality control section. So let me jump in and start with a perfect example. Uh, this is a printed circuit board cutting machine. And this is an example that's working in our Amberg plant in Germany, and it's cutting circuit boards for us there. Uh, and to give you a little background of the whole thing and what the problem was, uh, so this is actually a PCB cutting machine. It has a bunch of spindles. So 18 different spindles are cutting out these boards. So the blank green board goes in, as you've seen, and this machine cuts all the little tracks, it drills the holes, it gets it ready for soldering in the next process. Okay, the problem that we have with this machine is as it's cutting these boards, the green dust that comes off these boards is extremely aggressive. And it gets into the oils and into the bearings and it stops the machine. So you have 18 spindles and anytime between one month and six months, the machine will stop. And really you have no indication of when that's gonna happen. And it's causing a lot of unplanned downtime. It stops in the middle of the night. It costs shifts to go down. You have to bring in special people and pay them overtime to come in the middle of the night to fix it. It's very expensive. So this was a big problem we had with this machine. So what we tried to do was implement some AI not to fix that problem. I mean, the dust is going to take the machine down one way or another, regardless there's AI or not. But what we tried to do and our goal was to be able to predict when that machine was going to go down so that we could make a planned downtime. So we didn't have this unplanned downtime and machine damage and uh, PCB board damage, things like this. So that was the goal of this particular project. Uh, so again, I'll just show you a big picture overview of what we did here. And again, there's 18 spindles. This is a machine that's already running. So the good thing about AI and adding AI these days, and you've heard this mentioned a million times before, we don't have to dig into the actual machine code. Okay, that's already running. We don't wanna mess with it. We don't wanna change the loading. We can add AI using an edge device. And that's exactly what we did here. So it's kind of a separate system. And uh, in this case, the edge device was an IPC, a very powerful IPC. And you're gonna see when I talk about AI and the other uh, things that I show, that we can do AI in a lot of different areas. It is not like a one, it's not a cookie cutter, one size fits all. You can do this AI in an edge device, you can do it in the cloud, you can do it in a special card that works in the PLC level, depends on your application. So very, very flexible. So the first step here was to actually collect the data from the machine. So we set up this edge device and we did all the data collection that we needed to do. And this is motor currents, motor speeds, temperatures, all kinds of stuff, right? So we collected all this data and we actually ran the AI algorithms on this IPC. So what is it actually doing? We're running it, we're training it. What is it actually looking at? Let me show you a couple things. First of all, it's doing a trend analysis. So it's looking at motor current versus time and it's looking for that trend. It's looking for a rising trend because if your motor current is going up over time, it's kind of an indication that there's some friction there. It's being clogged down. Something might be happening with that dust, something not good. So that's one thing we looked at. The other thing we looked at was it's an anomaly detection. We're looking at motor current versus speed. So you can see there's kind of an, a normal operation range that we look for things to be in. And then there's also these red anomaly points you see on this little chart things fall out of that range and you start to question, okay, is something going wrong? What's happening? So we use that with the AI. We ran that algorithm, we trained it. We actually did the training on the IPC also. Important to know where we did the training because that can be different places. We did it on the IPC and then we sent those scores up into the cloud. Okay, and why did we do that? Well, the main reason for sending it into the cloud was because we had a couple of apps there in the cloud that were running uh, called Advanced Analytics and Performance Insight. Basically what they did was they took those anomaly scores uh, from the IPC and they converted it into something the operator could use to make a decision of when to plan maintenance. So more specifically, the Advanced Analytics basically took that score and predicted the amount of time that we have before it crashed so we could actually plan a downtime. And the Performance Insight, as you can see on the bottom of the page there, created a really nice dashboard for the operator. So the operator can actually see this and uh, you know, he can see exactly when the spindle is going to go down. And I think they had it set up to anything greater than a 0.5 on the, the anomaly scale. You better set something up so they could set up the maintenance and actually plan that downtime. So this was a huge advantage for people to know when this is going to happen. And it, it nearly eliminated the downtimes from unplanned uh, crashes and problems with spindles. <clears throat> and to give you a little bit of results, uh, so 
this is the results I was given, is about $180,000 or euros uh, per year we, we saved in loss of production. So this is anything from the loss of production, the extra shifts, uh, the damaged equipment uh, from the machine, the, the PCB boards lost, uh, the premium overtime we had to pay to get people to come in in the middle of the night to fix machines. It, it's a huge, uh, it adds up. When you have 18 spindles, uh, they had about $12,000 per spindles of savings. So a pretty big deal actually. And if you look at the other uh, figures below here for the transport unit and the box handler, these are systems around this other system, around the milling spindle and that whole system. Obviously, everything's a process in a sequence. So when that had downtime, unex you know, not prepared downtime, you actually had problems and bottlenecks in those other systems as well. So we had some savings there as well. So a pretty big savings. You can see how it optimized actually in this case. <clears throat> So let me jump into a different example. And this is maybe a little bit downstream. So once the PCB board is actually cut and it's all ready to be soldered, this next machine I'm gonna show you actually does that soldering and puts the stuff, makes all the solder points on the actual board. And the problem here is the X-ray. Let me again give you a description of the uh, overall here. Uh, so first of all, this is a PCB board again. This is putting the solder points on it. And it's for one of our IOs, one of our distributed IOs. It's in the same Omberg plant. Um, and what the problem is here is that once the board runs through the entire machine, every single board has to be inspected uh, by an X-ray, okay? And this is actually done by a humid, right? The, the, it goes through the X-ray and it comes up with a little picture like you see on the screen. This is kind of tiny, but there's actually an X-ray that pops up that looks like this. And an operator has to stand there and try to identify problems. If there was a bad solder or something like this, and that's extremely difficult to do. Imagine the human error that could be uh, intervened here trying to do that with one person looking at that and the monotony of that job. It's horrible. But it also was a huge, huge bottleneck. The time spent for every board to go through this machine. So the idea of adding AI, and again, not to tinker with the actual machine, but to add AI separately, was to actually eliminate sending some of these through the X-ray. So if we could have a model that actually showed, hey, this board, looks to be 100%, I don't see a reason to send it through the x-ray. And we can bypass the x-ray and some of those, we could save a lot of time. So that's kind of the idea. That's what we tried to do here in this case. And uh, again, to show you the bigger picture here, you can see the machine, uh, you can see actually the circuit board. So this is kind of the, the cut circuit board going in and the soldered up board comes out of the machine and then everything goes through the x-ray. That's how we were operating for a while, but it's causing a big bottleneck with this x-ray. Okay, so the first thing we did to add the AI, very similar to before, we took a very powerful IPC and we added this. This is an edge device, okay? We added it at the site and we collected data. And in this case, it's a lot more than the spindle cutting that I showed you. This, this data is in excess of 40,000 pieces of data. I mean, this is motor temperatures and currents and vibrations and anything you can name is put into this algorithm. And uh, the funny thing here that's different is the IPC edge device is not actually running. It's not doing the training. It's not taking this information and training the algorithm. The algorithm with that much data, we actually needed to put that into the cloud to train it. So that was a little too much for the IPC itself. So we actually sent it up into the cloud because up there we have lots more computational power to train these huge uh, algorithms. So the training was done in the cloud and then once it's trained in the cloud, it was actually put on the edge device and it actually ran on the edge device. So when the machine's running, it's actually on the edge device and the cloud work is done here, okay? Uh, so obviously we did a lot of training with this and a lot of testing to make sure the outcome was correct. And eventually we were able to connect it up to the MES system and actually make that decision of does the board go through the X-ray or does it not go through the X-ray? And uh, this is a pretty, dramatic uh, decrease in work because at the end of the day, we were able to save about 30%. That means 30% of the boards were able to bypass the x-ray and go straight to the next processing point. So that's a really big deal. And uh, the uh, the quality rate of what was let through was, okay, we say 100%. I'm, I'm also an engineer. I never believe when I say 100%, but very close to 100% is that what went through really, what, what passed through were no flaws. Okay, now there were a lot of boards obviously that went through the x-ray that came out perfectly fine, but the goal was just to eliminate some of these. So we tried to knock down the amount that was done and that was very much accomplished. 
Also, we were able to eliminate one x-ray because there were multiple x-rays here, and now we don't need the multiple x-rays. We came down to one x-ray and eliminated uh, about a half a million dollars there. So a really, a really big advantage to using AI in this application. So I think a good example too, I, I hope you guys have seen similar uh, processes as well, but I thought I'd point that one out. I thought that was pretty cool how we applied that. <clears throat> uh, the next area I wanna talk about is robotics. So this is a really interesting area too. Uh, one of the big areas in robotics is it, it with using AI, you can actually pick up objects in different positions. They don't have to be in a specific position using a uh, very low cost cameras you can actually take a look at this object and figure out a grasping point and let me show you a quick video on grasping point and just walk through how this works if you haven't seen this before uh, you can see the camera on top of this robot is a pretty inexpensive camera uh, i think that's the intel sense or real sense camera i think by intel uh, basically it takes a look at the object it wants to pick up and it can determine then what are all the grasping points it has as options to pick this up and we have a lot of demos here at Siemens that we show that use this technology. It really works and it's really cool. And this is one of the main benefits when you use AI within robotics. As you can see, it's also picked off three spots here and it runs through the neural net, runs the calculation to see what the probability of success is gonna be. So the first one it comes up with is pretty low. The second one it comes up with is a little bit better. And you're gonna see as it runs through this, it comes up with one that's pretty high probability and it decides to go with that. So this is a really nice thing. You don't have to program all this stuff. The uh, AI algorithm is figuring out the best way to pick up this object and the most success. And uh, we've got several demos running on this using both IPCs and special little card level processors. It's a really cool way to apply AI within robotics. And uh, so I wanna show you, that kind of leads into the example I wanna show you a little bit. This is specifically good in the CPG industry. So consumer packaged goods, uh, you know, when we actually sell things today, everything's gotta have a variety and things are changing continually. So if you just look at the screen here, you can kind of get an idea. I think the girl in this picture is pretty specific on what she wants. So apparently she, she likes pink. So a lot of consumers have very specific needs. And if you wanna be successful selling, you have to meet those needs. And uh, that means you have to change your line very quickly uh, to personalize things, names on Coke cans, uh, things like what you see in this picture. And uh, CPG industry is somewhere where AI is really uh, proving to be very efficient. And I wanna show you an example here. This is a really cool thing. This is a project we did together with another uh, company called Klusterman's. It was a co-creation project. And early in the, earlier in the panelist discussion, somebody mentioned there's a lot of this co-creation going on. Uh, for sure it is. I mean, AI is an open field. Uh, it's very, very flexible as to how you do it. Uh, so this project in particular was a 90 day challenge. So what I'm showing you here all happened within three months span. And so it's pretty impressive the rate that we got this up and running and working, what you're gonna see. And I'm only showing you a small part of this video. This, is, this video goes on for 10 minutes without break. And uh, I wish I could show the whole thing, but I'm only gonna show a little, a few clips of it. Uh, keep in mind too, when I say 90 days or three months, uh, we didn't start from a blank piece of paper at that point, okay? We had uh, a lot of AI libraries built up that we applied to this machine, which I think is also very exciting moving forward because one of the problems today with AI is that you, you don't have to be, I'm not gonna say a PhD in AI to use AI, but you do have to have quite a bit of knowledge in AI uh, to make things really work realistically. And the, the I think the holy grail moving forward is for the average programmer, the average guy who programs a PLC or a machine to be able to take some libraries and apply it and make it work without having a PhD in AI. That's the, that's the holy grail, I think. And uh, we will get there, I think. It's gonna be a little while. But let me show you what we did accomplish. And I'm gonna show you this uh, raw footage running. I hope you can hear my voice over the machine. It's, it's not that loud, but I'll explain what's happening here a little bit. <clears throat> Let me start this up. So this is the machine and you can see there's two robots and they have a very simple suction cup on the bottom. And what we're packaging here is a little blister pack uh, for shaving. So there's shaving cream, there's aftershave, there's razors, uh, there's the razor blades. And right now it's starting off with something really simple, it's starting off with the aftershave. So you can see uh, the AI is it's using AI this whole time. 
but it's a very simple thing right now. It can act, it can like take a quick look at the actual lotion. It can very quickly see it's in the right position. The label is up. I don't need to use the other robot at all. I can just put this into the case and no problem. So keep in mind, this is AI. So it's a task that's been programmed here. So what we do, if he wants to move to the next product that goes in here, uh, he simply changes it on the HMI and says, hey, now I want the shaving cream, not the aftershave. So he puts it into the HMI and it's the same, the robots are doing the same thing. It's just a different object they're looking for. And notice the way he sets that on the table. He just throws it on the table. He rolls the stuff around. It doesn't matter what's facing up, where it is. The robot will find that using vision equipment, very inexpensive vision equipment. Okay, this is the same camera that I showed you earlier, the real sense. And what it has to do is it has to take this shaving cream and it has to put it in this cart with the label up. Okay, so it finds it. If it can do it with just one robot, it'll do it. But this next one it picks up, the label's not up. So it really has to use the other robot to find the top of the bottle and put it in the blister pack correctly. So it can use either zero handoff, one handoff, or two handoff, and it makes that decision. So it doesn't matter really where the guy throws it on the table or what position it's rolled into, the robot can do that. That's really cool. And like I said, I skipped a little bit here. There were several things in there also that uh, I could have showed you. It was very similar to what I already showed. What they did in between the last segment I showed you and now is they actually changed the suction cup to a smaller suction cup. It's a little white suction cup now on the robot because it's a different item. They're picking up these razors. And notice how it puts it in the blister pad. This is the same task that was being done with the other objects. It's just a different object. So it really, the amount of program to do this is significantly less. And imagine if you changed your product moving forward, you could very, very easily adapt another product to this and use the same task. It's already programmed and done. So that's the big advantage in the CPG world uh, using AI. And again, this is what you're seeing here is, uh, it's just like footage from a test scene. They're playing around with this, getting it to work. You can see now it's moving on to the razor blades. And all the guy did was tell it, hey, now you now you got to pack the razor blades. So this robot is uh, just go ahead and doing that. It's the same exact thing it was doing before. You can see if it needs the other robot, the other robot grabs it and helps out. So this is a pretty cool application uh, that happens in the CPG world. Now imagine how fast you could change your products if you needed to in that case. So that's a, a really unique application. And again, note that that was three months. And uh, again, like I said, I'm not going to say we started with a blank page and uh, we didn't have all the king's horses and all the king's men, but we did have some of the smartest king's horses and men on that. So uh, it was it, that did help. Uh, but you can see how this can be effective using the CPG machine. It's incredible because anybody who wants to be successful in market today is going to have to react to market changes quickly. Is going to have to offer these different products. Uh, we all shop on Amazon. We expect to order something and expect it customized and expect it at our house in two days. So that's kind of the uh, mentality we're working toward in this environment. And this is exactly where AI is perfect in this industry. So those are a couple of really cool applications I wanted to show you. And uh, sorry, I had to kind of race through that and I cut some of the uh, information out, but that was quality control and robotics. Like we said before in the previous panel discussions and the presentations, there's a lot of applications for AI. I have a lot of great applications in automatic sorting and visual inspection, all these areas you see on the screen. It's all over the board. So I just wanted to touch on a couple of them that I thought maybe you'd be interested to see. And uh, I hope that was valuable and I hope you enjoyed that. And uh, yeah, look forward to doing more AI in the future. So that's kind of what I had in those examples. And I think my time's about up. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Thank you for the lovely demo. Yeah. No problem. I, it's great that I'm seeing it for the second time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A little more detail, maybe. A little more detail. Yeah. yeah, yeah absolutely. And uh, I hope the audience also enjoyed it along with the other speakers as well. Thank you for such giving such a lovely one. Oh, thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. Guys, any questions for Jim? <clears throat> Like I mentioned earlier, you can also you can obviously type in the Q&A section and the speakers will be happy to help you out. So we'll wait for one minute. If no question is there, we'll move on to our last presentation for the day. Okay, and if there's no questions, if anybody has something later, 
Uh, obviously, find me on LinkedIn. You can always ask these questions. Uh, like I said, me and my team, we love to promote these uh, these latest technologies. So we love to hear your questions. And uh, we have a lot of pilots going on right now with AI across the country with some of our new equipment. It's a very interesting topic. And uh, again, I, I'd really appreciate the presentations before this. That was a spot on great lead in to exactly what I wanted to show. And uh, now I don't feel like I cut it too short because I didn't need to repeat that. <laughs> great, great, Jim. Yeah, I'd love to connect with you again, uh, Jim, to understand more on what do you do. In, uh, I think you have a lovely uh, products and demos to show. Maybe Thank I you. missed that because the time was less. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's all right. Great, great. Thank you. Thank you, Jim, for the lovely presentation. See you uh, very soon. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. See you. Have a lovely weekend. Take care. So, guys, I will quickly move on to our last presentation for the day, uh, which is by Dr. Yen Chai Shang, founder and CEO of Mata Inventive. Uh, his topic is fusing artificial intelligence with equipment monitoring for manning optimization. Over to you, Yen, please. Thank you. All right. Uh, thanks, Nathan, and thanks for the opportunity. And uh, I just want to like say a few uh, like this budget, like what Jim was saying that you know like uh, a lot of uh, the panelists have mentioned some really great points uh, so far already. Uh, and so uh, let me share the screen with you guys. Um, Yeah, we can see that. You just have to make it screen presentation mode something. Yeah, yeah. Okay, right, let's, uh, let's go to the first. You had 53 slides. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. A lot of it is just for animation purposes. Yeah. Okay, okay, great. Yeah. Great, great. No, no, no issues. Yeah, please. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, today what we want to talk about is the uh, manufacturing sector and how AI can be applied to um, some of the important topics. And uh, I want to uh, reference some of the things that the uh, 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 Jamie and uh, other panelists have said, um, which is the uh, how um, how AI is like always being asked to like uh, what is AI and also um, what are how do we get people involved? Um, how do we uh, fight um, like some uh, um, some uh, man uh, manufacturing uh, operations um, resistance to the adoption of AI? So we'll touch base on that and especially addressing some of the uh, key issues that happens on the shop floor and uh, follow, follow that up with some of the uh, um, really interesting examples we have by collaborating with uh, some of our uh, partnering uh, machine shops. So first I want to ask that the main topic um, of uh, what we're gonna talk about today is uh, how Model Inventive uses uh, AI to address the prof profitability uh, efficiency issues on some uh, commonly uh, facing challenge, uh, common uh, commonly faced challenges that uh, manufacturing facility management that has to face. One is to uh, the first and the most important thing is to uh, for a lot of management, what they have to do is to uh, to give competitive quotes. So when a client asks you, um, you know, like, can you give me a like a good price, a better price? You have to make it low enough to uh, to make that quote competitive and appealing to the clients you are trying to obtain. But also you have your, um, you know, you have to buy yourself lunch, right? So uh, how do you make your shop uh, or facilities to stay profitable but while still being able to uh, maintain a competitive quote? And once you've done that, um, you know, like done the calculation you have to make sure that, you know, like, you know, that's the kind of price we can accept with the, um, the reasonable um, profit margin that you have in mind. The next thing that you have to do is to schedule that job into your pipeline. And make sure they run effectively. And the third thing is that you know we all know that nothing nothing is perfect, especially that's why AI uh, is useful. And in this case, it's like sometimes things can happen, like materials can come uh, short, and also a machine can have breakdown, 
uh, and some uh, people can take a sick leave. Um, in this case, in this environment, um, we've seen that an entire shop floor shut down because some uh, operators got COVID, right? So uh, bottlenecks is definitely something can be uh, uh, needs to be addressed as quickly as possible because if not, then um, you know you lose your profit margin and you lose your on-time delivery, which eventually lose your credibility, right? And uh, and the most important thing is that once you know the bottleneck has happened. How do we stop that from really affecting the profit margin you have in mind? And address that uh, right in time uh, before it's too late. And now with the help of AI as to how to address that even before it happens. And like I said, uh, like the, uh, the previously mentioned uh, already is that uh, so some of the upcoming um, or has like, emerged uh, challenges that we're facing right now after COVID is the sh increased shipping costs. Uh, we've seen um, our shop, um, our partners uh, complaining to us is that shipping cost is, uh, is like five times more now. So how do we use AI to address that? That's an important topic as well. And also labor shortage. We've heard complaints is that there are some shop floor uh, operators refuse to come back to the workforce just because, you know, staying at home and collecting uh, unemployment seems to be a better choice, right? So if that happens, what do you have to do? So here we list like five common uh, five uh, common categories of the manufacturing manufacturing sectors that uh, we have success um, collaborating with. Uh, but obviously, uh, it can be used for even more categories. But um, we found a like, good success of uh, to combine machine monitoring with um, AI for additive manufacturing, um, CNC machining, and semiconductor injection molding and forge, uh, forging uh, machinery. So for those previously mentioned um, issues that we commonly face on the shop floor, um, they can be managed actually manually um, when the facility is not as big, when uh, when the business is just starting up, right? Then like a, a lot of times as an owner or a manager, we can solve that problems quick enough and timely enough, like um, if you can just look over everyone's shoulder, Right. But that kind of stops working when the facility has grown to a certain level. Right. And when that happens, what, what happens when that cannot be addressed manually uh, in time? You have wasted time because, you know, it's uh, your your uh, your uh, your machines will stay idle and you have wasted money. Uh, because you still have to pay your employees bec um, just because the machine side doesn't mean that people stop um, requiring salary. And the worst, is, the worst thing is that you don't you lose the productivity because if your spindle is not like well, this is a quote from like, one of our clients is that if your spindle is not running, then we cannot charge for anything. So no matter what we use, machine monitoring, AI, all we want is to make sure our machine is always on. And definitely 2021 is not the first year where we start to solve those problems, right? And it's not the first year where people try to automate uh, some of these processes through um, automation, AI, or monitoring, right? And there are some typical reasons, uh, like previously mentioned, like 72% of um, people are not happy with their um, AI investment, right? And I think that there are similar uh, stats for automation and uh, machine monitoring as well. And uh, there are typical reasons, some typical reasons that um, these things just uh, fail. And one is that the uh, the machine monitoring solutions that um, a facility have chose, has chosen um, is not compatible with all of their equipment. And that's, that's creating a huge problem. And the reason being is that if you're only able to monitor like 40% of your uh, equipment, and the other 60 is either not compatible or too legacy. Um, you just can't monitor it. You just can't monitor it. If that's the case, then you're only monitoring 40% of your shop floor. Then that's not telling you the full story. And also on the software end, that's an important issue as well is that I think for everyone that's in the uh, manufacturing world is that uh, can, can sort of like relate to this uh, uh, problem, which is that Unless you work for a big company that builds everything in-house, most likely uh, we have some kind of a experience with um, having to use multiple software, P 
pieces. And uh, they're really good at doing what they promise and what they can deliver. For example, coding software is really good at coding, giving them code. And ERP software is really good at uh, managing your whole uh, schedule uh, and attendance, for example. And uh, MES is really good at reporting. QA software is really good at feeding back the here results. But industrial software uh, world is really fragmented that um, those softwares don't talk to each other well enough. So as an owner or as a manager, we're not seeing the full picture. So that's one of the big reasons some of the automation failed. And the uh, second is a really interesting topic is that, um, so right now um, a popular uh, standard for uh, machine monitoring um, is MT Connect. And we've seen um, equipment manufacturers that provide native MT Connect uh, support that um, just don't give correct output. So when that happens, you know, sometimes it's really devastating for, uh, if your machine is not opening the correct data, then uh, you're not facing your judgment or AI cannot be used at all if the input is wrong, right? And the third case is really uh, the most common is that um, even if your software pieces are 100% in sync and harmony talking to talking with each other communicating perfectly and if the uh, monitoring results are calibrated nothing is wrong the worst case is that people are not really taking advantage of data of the data and a lot of times we hear sources that yeah we, we have the dashboard but no one's looking at it right because the data is not actionable right so my AI in these kind of scenarios is that um, I think like our previous uh, panelists have already like, like touched base on the, this kind of topic already, but here's like a brief, over, brief overview is that how can we use AI is that um, a lot of times we can base on our um, um, performance on the, you know, our past data and see like, okay, like if you're standing at like now um, um, and the, Judging by our past data, I'm up, right? But just like stock market, two things can happen. One is that your future will keep going up. The other is that your future has some kind of bottleneck that happens that prevents your productivity from keeping from keep, from increasing, and it actually plummets. So what AI is powerful of doing is that it can sort of like predict the possibilities of that downfall, and sort of like uh, alert. Uh, associated personnel of uh, such delayed reasons, and when would when do you expect that from uh, to happen, and how do you address that before it happens? So um, we have an example from the previous talk about how to um, prevent um, uh, future maintenance uh, needs, um, sort of like predictive predict uh, future maintenance needs, and uh, sort of address that before it happens, and um, the other areas we can do that uh, apply the same logic as well is that. Um, will we see any bottlenecks from a specific operator or do we see bottlenecks from a specific uh, um, part number or specific uh, client? And whenever that happens, we need to address that issue and feed it back to what you're currently doing right now and sort of fix it before the problem actually happens. So that's the, that's the power of AI is to say, like uh, live machine monitoring tells you what's currently going on as a snapshot as of right now. The one that combining AI with live machine monitoring is to take advantage of this kind of a, a monitoring concept and sort of like look into the future to see what's the current step and snapshot is going to look like 30 days down the road, 60 days down the road. <clears throat> so we achieved this by uh, first by installing a machine monitoring system, and we need to make sure that it's compatible with all of your... Uh, uh, machines that no one gets left out. And uh, we we'll make sure that um, it's uh, it's in sync and it's put to get together in the same place with your coding software, ERP, MES, to be able to sync all the data side by side. So compare four most important metrics, uh, metrics that we found so far. One is the um, how do you code it and how do you schedule it and how is it how is it reported and how is it measured? 
there's a quote is that you tell your client that you know like this is how much time it's going to take for uh when the machines uh, for 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 us to finish the job and schedule is that how uh when you put in your schedule does it really make sense and should it be um should you leave this facility by what date and what time and and reported is that um from your MEA system we see um you know how it's being executed on the, on the shop floor and measured is from the monitoring system um what's actually been going on right so our ai is able to uh, put all four of them together in one place to display as a dashboard and also analyze in a cloud as an ai prediction to find any discrepancies between those four and that's what ai engine does and only by doing that that we can have full transparency on the shop floor. If we leave any one of those pieces out, then it's like we said before, it opens it in any ways, then you're like, it's kind of like a, the quote I always like to use is that half measure is um, you know worse than no measure actually in a lot of cases. So here I want to use an example of our um, partner, uh, True Position Machining. Um, they rep represent a good, um, uh, example of um, using cutting edge technologies and also facing a very typical um, challenge that um, shop floors have, which is the high mix, um, high mix, high, high mix low volume or high, high mix high volume challenges. And here's your contact information wherever needed. And here's an example of how we uh, go about this uh, journey is that first of all, we make sure that the life status is reported on every single machine. First, how long the machine has been idled and uh, which job is machine is running. And also uh, if, there, if there is any maintenance need, right? And uh, to, when we do the part counts, how many parts has this machine be uh, producing today? And the second thing, the second step is that uh, once we've made sure of that, is that uh, we combine that with the ERP data to see what jobs are being scheduled right now and how it's being reported and uh, how's the actual operation uh, reported from the machine and comparing all those three, that we're able to uh, to really, really com like shrink the differences of all three. Um, and the, the last step is that once we have all that, we'll be able to feed that information to AI and to identify really, like you can see the, um, the indicator of AI prediction, we see like um, what's actually going to be like stay on schedule and what's actually at risk, right? When, like in this case, for example, we know that uh, we're seeing good results um, come uh, for the included jobs, but then uh, there might be some risk coming from uh, this machine, for example. And the next step is that once we know how the machine was running, each machine per day, how it's running, we zoom out and see how it does per week, right? So we can look at the schedule, look into your future production schedule and identify which jobs are supposed to have some delivery risk and you can address those problems um, before they happen. And then the next step is that once you know there is a delay risk, then how do you address them? Where do they come from, right? We say that you can solve it before, before it happens and how do you, where do you look at? And that's where the AI breaks down the possible reasons of delay. And in this case, for example, we see everything looks kind of good. And uh, there's some spikes of risk coming from the client uh, uh, panel. In this case, we break it down to see which client is causing, is, is having the most high possible, highest possibility of delay. And then we break it down to see like, um, what are the possible affected job numbers? What are the affected work centers? And what are the associate technicians that can contribute to this delay? And this is the real life example of the, uh, to verify the results of that, because a, 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 a common thing to, 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 to be aware of for AI is that everyone AI, right? But really the, the, the truth is how accurate it is, right? So in this case that um, about a month ago, we found um, some large um, uh, alarming signal coming from the QA QC department, as you can see here, 38% of the um, delay can come from the QC department. And as we can see that um, 
there at the time that is planned, we don't see any potential risk of delay. But what we actually verified 30 days later is that the QA actually took twice as long to run. And imagine how much power you can have and how empowered you are knowing that 30 days later, you can, you can see what's going on 30 days later um, and even before it happens and how do you address that, right? So here's a little breakdown of what we do. Um, and over, right now we're about uh, 85% accurate in terms of identifying potential bottlenecks. And uh, overall that summarizes into uh, $1 million of uh, increased revenue um, in one year period. And some takeaway notes is that um, we are, um, there's some existing um, challenges and uh, artificial intelligence can help with those challenges. And uh, those that we mentioned are just uh, for examples. And there are other, definitely other areas that AI can be applied. And uh, really there's no difference in like the, the, whether there's like a size of facility that doesn't fit or does fit um, for the use of artificial intelligence. And always a good approach is to start small and laser focus on something that really needs to be addressed first. And finally, that um, right now we're uh, um, offering some. Uh, I think it's it's good to uh, that we can uh, test the AI. Um, you know, like so. Feel free to if you're interested in learning uh, whether your facility can be uh, can be benefit can benefit from um, AI. Um, right now, we found it pretty useful to just uh, send us the, some of the data you want to uh, want to analyze. Then uh, we can. Uh, um, um, send you back the AI results and see whether it's a good fit or not. And uh, these uh, slides are uh, downloadable uh, from the handout section. So uh, feel free to contact us um, if you're interested. And that's it. Thank you, Ian. Thank you for the lovely presentation and giving a great insight. And in the uh -huh. second last slide, it summed up all the things which you, uh, which you wanted to say about what is going on in the manufacturing sector. Uh -huh. Thank you. Uh, letting people know about Mata and Inventive as well. So if Thank anybody you. wants to connect with Dr. Yen, they can obviously connect uh, him in the social media. Uh, LinkedIn is there. His company is there. You can obviously go to the website and uh, get connected to him. Any questions, guys? Anything any one of you have? This is the last uh, talk for the day. Just take a pause of ten seconds. If you if you don't have the question, I'll just wrap it up. Doctor Yen, you want to say any last words? Um, no, no. Just in general, like um, you know, appreciate opportunity. Opportunity, and uh, overall, it's great to uh, to learn. Um, you know, like the the comrades that's just like you know currently in this field, and definitely uh, yeah. it's a it's it's a, it's an upcoming field. Like um, there's finally uh, gaining some. I think. People used to uh, not really believe in AI. People don't like to change until there's a crisis, which I think really COVID gives the opportunity, right? Because people were probably traditionally didn't want to adopt like robotic arms in on the shop floor, for example, right? But right now there's a labor shortage, then people are thinking about adopting it. So I think yes. when there is a challenge, there's opportunity, yeah. You, you told one thing right. Unless people get an urge to change, they will not change. And, right, right. <laughs> and, and, and the COVID has given the thought process people how to adopt the digital technologies and all these. So AI, machine learning, deep learning, these are something which is going, which will be going on in the next few yeah, years as, yeah. as well. Yeah. yeah. For sure. Thank you. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you, uh, Dr. Yen. See you. and uh, We'll love to connect with you very soon. Cool. For sure. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, guys. So just to wrap up, uh, we would like to thank our technology partner, Digit7, and all our community partners who supported us, speakers, attendees, all our stakeholders who came together for enriching knowledge through this forum. Please log on to our website and like the social media channels because we will be sharing lots of knowledge sharing topics, details, announcement of next events, and much more, which will help you register and attend the quality events with quality speakers. Just for your information, today's event was and is live broadcasted live in the YouTube and Facebook channel of our company. 
so you all can go and see the recording anytime. Again, I'm reiterating on September 28th, that is after three days on Tuesday, next Tuesday, we are also coming up with a webinar with the theme, Learn How AI is Transforming Manufacturing Sector. And there are four quality speakers for that particular day as well. So uh, the timing is 8.45 to 10.15 a.m. CT time. We'll send details to all of you uh, so that you do not miss out on the same. There are lots more in store for subsequent months as well with focus on cybersecurity, telecom, IoT, and blockchain. So these are four emerging topics for the next few months till December. So you just stay connected with us and enjoy the learning. Thank you all. Thank you all for the lovely day. Take care. Have a lovely weekend ahead. And we'll, I'd love to connect with you all in the near future as well. Thank you. Okay. Bye.